let's start on the right hand side of the, uh, the update. So maybe we start with the guarantees. I think that's the biggest thing everybody's concerned about. I just yep. had a couple of conversations, a couple of clients. I even sent out an email blast where you, where you, um, where I put your video talking about the, the latest changes and what to be aware of. Mm -hmm. and there's, you know, there's still a little confusion, but I think, you know, you hear it a couple of times over and over again, and then it, it should, it should land. And I think right. the biggest thing people are asking is, is this bad for the customer? Is this good for the customer? Is there a, a profit and loss? Is there a, a pro and con? And, you know, I was basically saying to my clients so far, I've been saying, you know, yes, there's a, there's a gain and a loss, but when you compare it to what's already in place, there isn't that much of a difference. In fact, I would argue that for people that are in their later years, like most of my clients are over the age of 40, 50, approaching 60, that for the same death benefit that they got approved for, they can now put in more funds with the same death benefit and then require them to get more death benefit where they wouldn't qualify for because of their age and health. And to give an example, I, I had a client that uh, is, they were looking to put in I think 70,000 a year, but for a long period of time, I think over 15 years or so, but okay. they were, but with Guardian, they were only able to do it for about a solid nine, according to the death benefit. Right. Um, and then that number dropped a little bit. So I'm assuming under the new MEC laws, new changes that that person would be able to put in the 70, but for a much longer period of time, because there's more MEC space. Uh, which would allow them to do that. That's that's correct. So what you've got there is the same death benefit gets you more mech space on a life insurance policy. So it does have a relationship to the guarantees as well to provide a little bit more information there. For example, today, still with the 4% guaranteed rate, how it works is if you have an age 40 male with a 4% guarantee, you would need almost exactly $2.8 million in total death benefit to get, call it a $100,000 MEC limit. Does that part make sense? Correct. Let me write that out. So yep. say it one more time. Yep. So if you've got a age 40 male, $2.8 million in total life insurance gives you a $100,000 MEC limit. And that is based on a 4% guarantee. Right. So that's current design. Correct, based on current current MEC laws. Mm -hmm. So in order to put yeah. in a hundred grand, that forty year old male would need to qualify for two point eight million a death benefit. They would need to show roughly how much in income per year. Um, to get a two point eight million dollar death benefit, you need about sixty to seventy thousand dollars in annual income to qualify for that. Really, that's it. So a thirty x multiplier at age forty you would get. So if you're seventy k per year times 30 would give you the, uh, it'd be 21, I'm sorry. So it'd be about, um, what are the, 90,000, I'm sorry. Got it, and if they're putting in 100 grand, does the insurance company, you know, in terms of the actual financial capability, if they're only making 100 grand a year, would the insurance company like, look at that like- Shut it down? Yeah. Yeah, would they shut it down? So it depends on the situation. Um, a lot of times in that particular case where someone's putting in more money than what they're earning. Usually they've got funds, whether they sold a piece of property, they received an inheritance, like they've got a lump sum or access to cash. That's usually where we run into those type of issues. Okay, so what would be like a realistic income, mm -hmm. just based off income, not assets, mm -hmm. for someone to be able to realistically afford to pay in a hundred grand a year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, it will depend on their, their situation, I mean, Typically what'll happen, I kind of see where you're going here, based on their income, they're usually going to qualify for the total death benefit needed, but where this, and the visuals will help here, where this becomes advantageous is if you stick to the age 40 male with the $2.8 million death benefit, and you wanted to pay in, kind of like you mentioned earlier, 100K per year for 15 years, and you wanted to use Guardian, for example, that's where you would have to have a higher death benefit, might right. be four million or so, which you might not qualify for based on your income. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does it. that make sense? Yeah, that, that makes sense. I think the in and at any point in time, guys, for those that are listening, comment below if you're like, what, you know, repeat that, and we'll keep honing yeah. in on it, pack it different ways so that it's it's very very clear. 
So this is current design and yeah. individual, you know, insurance companies are going to look at that income to determine or, or qualify just because they qualify for the high death benefit, but they're looking to put in this amount in cash that, that might get them a little uh, questioning that model. Now, one, mm -hmm. one thing that I think I've heard other insurance agents use in the past and, and um, one in particular, our, our, our friend of ours, uh, Jerry Feta, says, uh, you know, 25% of your income is, is, a, is a solid number to put into life insurance or what an individual would qualify for. Mm -hmm. uh, how accurate is, is that? Is that like a safe thing to say when a client says, well, what is the max amount of money I can put into a policy according to my, my yeah. income and age? What does that yeah. look like? That's a good question. So that typically has to do with the total scheduled premium. So if you're scheduling premium and or PUA payments, that is what the insurance company is going to say, okay, here's what the client is committing themselves to. So for example, is my screen still crooked or did the change fix it? No, it's still crooked. No. Ah, I love it. So I'm not, I can't write backwards. Sorry, Tim. Um, so if I earn a hundred thousand right. dollars, mm -hmm, for example, um, and I am committing, I want to commit to a certain payment, the maximum an insurance company will typically be comfortable with would be 25%. So that'd be $25,000 in that case. Now, with that said, there's a very easy workaround to that. And this is where PUA flexibility comes into play. Whatever I'm committed to, whether it's premium or PUA payments, that's where a company is going to say 25% income is the absolute max. Some states like, like New York state prefer a 15% max of, of annual earned income. With that said, a workaround there is with an unscheduled PUA rider. Got it. Mm -hmm. So an unscheduled PUA rider is unscheduled. A policyholder can make the payment if they want to, they don't have to. That's often where an individual will say, okay, like I earn hundred thousand dollars per year. I may commit to, if it's 25,000, maybe it's only 10,000, whatever I'm comfortable with. And then at my discretion, I'll add additional funds into PUAs based on my cash flow, based on my situation. And that piece is not scrutinized or underwritten by the insurance company because it's up to the policyholder. They may add it, they might not add it. It's in their control and based on their non-committed finances if that makes sense got it which there was a case where i uh I, I i remember this off the top of my head i have a client that she designed a policy putting in forty thousand a year but her income per month is somewhere around 5500 i think 6k max is her income and she designed a policy putting in 40k a year base premium is 4000 went with guardian and then has unscheduled PUA payments where she basically uh works to get to the 40k amount working off of just 5506k in income which I found very interesting I mean I, when I was working I was like look you know this isn't exactly the easiest thing in the world to do so let's just keep in mind that if we don't get there we don't beat ourselves up but the nice part is you you totally maximized the total amount of money you could stuff into one policy and whether you do that each year or over time you've got that flexibility to to right. do so and so mm -hmm. that's with current design and her death benefit you know is is higher under the new design what does that look like yeah, so that's where the guaranteed rate will actually have an impact on the new MEC limit as well. So I'll walk you through this slowly. So with the old one, that 40 year old male, $2.8 million death benefit with a 4% guarantee gives you a MEC limit of 100K. If a new company and product has a guaranteed rate of 3%, what that would result in you would only need just north of $2 million. The exact number is $2,050,000 with a 3% guarantee gives you the same $100,000 MEC limit. New MEC laws. So let's do that one more time. 40 year old male, same amount. Yep. And what was that uh, 
New two debt. million, two million fifty thousand dollars gives you a one hundred thousand dollar MEC limit if the product has a three percent guarantee. Okay, so that's seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars less in death benefit. Correct. Therefore, to your same point earlier, amount, right mm -hmm. for the same amount of funding. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. If you have a two percent guarantee. Then you need, it's about a 1.45, call it a $1.5 million death benefit. It's a little bit less, but let's round 1.5 million for the same $100,000 MEC limit. If it's a 2% floor. Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So now if I'm dealing with someone that really cares about the death benefit, right? Because that's not typically the case when we're working with our clientele, they're more concerned about the cash value growth, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the starting cash value, the liquidity in it. But let's say I'm dealing with someone that wants more death benefit. Um, under the new MEC laws, this would be not advantageous to someone that really cares about the death benefit. Would it be wise to, you know, if they're looking at infinite banking and they're like, okay, this is great, but I still want some more death benefit just for that protection. Would you then say, um, go yeah. buy some term? Um, you could do that, right? So if you're getting that a healthy thing to do, you know, you, you could, or if you really like the death benefit and the cash value, I mean, that's where the old one, I mean, hands down makes more sense in that respect. Okay. Right. Simply because if you can get the same mech limit of hundred K, similar cash value performance from a non-guaranteed standpoint, but stronger guarantees, but a higher death benefit. If the death benefit's important, the old one hands down makes more sense. Or to your point, if you like the new one or you got in too late, then you could layer it with term as well. Got it, got it. Let's go over, in addition to this, this work, since we're dealing with mech, new, new updates and stuff, um, how long does an individual have to, to make that decision now that we're approaching the end of 2021, stepping into the new year. Um, and we can use a couple different companies. I know you did a, a video on this already, but we can, you know, use the, the top four as an example of mm -hmm. when the, when the cutoff points are. So you've got the guardian yeah. mass mutual, New York life, Northwestern. Do you know all the, I think you mm -hmm. did, I think your video covered these three companies. Correct. Yeah. Northwestern. Um, I don't have that info yet just because they're exclusive to captive agents. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Eventually we'll get it. So, so guardian, what's that cutoff point? Yep. So guardian, as far as the deadline to submit an application, so you can still get the 4% guarantee, there is no deadline. The only deadline that one needs to be aware of if they're applying, if they're applying with guardian, is the IRS deadline, which is December 31st. We have to have a policy signed, paid for, in force before 2022, basically, before 1231, 2021. Why I say before is most companies will be closed on 1231, being Got it. New Year's Eve. Yep. Okay. So before mm -hmm. that day. So that means if I submitted an application on December 20th, it's yep. likely I'm too late. <laughs> Most likely, yes. So yeah. you do want to give yourself some time there, at least at least three weeks. Um, I would say even four, just for for personal comfort, because underwriting can take some time. Um, but yes, you're you're correct. That if you're submitting it two days beforehand, the likelihood is it's not going to be approved in time. And if if you do apply during 2021 and you're approved in 2022, you cannot get the four percent guarantee because it's an IRS deadline. If I start a policy in 2022, that's it. Like I'm ba I'm locked into the new laws and new limits. Okay. So with that, let's say um, you're working with a client, right? Yeah. Working with an agent uh, or agent or client, either one. They're, they got illustrated a policy with a 4% base yep. and with a non-guaranteed mm -hmm. dividend, but they, for whatever reason, missed the deadline, right? Mm-hmm. Do you, the agent, have to design a new illustration so that it matches what they're actually going to get? Or, oh, yeah, big time. For, for compliance, right? 
Okay. For com compliance and for the consumer's interest. I mean, if they're if it is a cash value driven sale, like if they're interested in the cash value, if I'm the consumer, I'd want to see that immediately. Meaning, hey, show me what it looks like because I'm locked into the new rates now. We want to redesign the policy, lower the death benefit. You can keep the same premium and PUA split. The companies have not changed that if their minimum is 10% or whatever that base is. That hasn't been changed with companies, but you do need to redesign it because, for example, if you're looking at Use Guardian as an example with that 4% guarantee and you're 40 years old, you've got a 2.8 million death benefits, so you can pay in 100 grand per year. And now you're in 2022 and Guardian filed their guaranteed rate at 3% across the board. Yeah. Like if you if your goal is cash value and here's my dollar figure, if it's 100 grand, 10 grand, whatever, we definitely want to redesign that. This way we don't sacrifice any cash value performance by going too high on the insurance expense. Right, because if that's the case, you would redesign it for the lower death benefit, not the higher correct. death benefit. That's correct, yep. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. So with that being said, Guardian cut off. They don't, Guardian doesn't have a deadline, but the uh, uh, prospect or if you're an agent writing a policy, you should be informing your clients at least let's, let's get this in play uh, four weeks, five weeks in advance, at, at least by November, know exactly what design you, you want funding, submit that application, go through the underwriting, and you have to have the policy paid for, right? You have to that that also takes a couple of days, right? Processing the payment, or if um, I pro if I process the payment on uh, December thirtieth, I'm good. Correct, you're good as long as you process the payment and formally sign by December thirtieth. Got it. You're good, but but to your point, like if we submit a policy, if someone says, "Hey, I'm approved, I'm ready to start twelve thirty, it takes the insurance company typically a couple of days just to receive the final go ahead and then send it to the client. So I would give it a couple of days just to be safe. I'm pretty sure. Uh, do you foresee a lot of um, confusion happening in the next couple months mm -hmm. with, with clients, with other agents having to deal yeah. with this? Do you, do you... Yeah, <laughs> it, big, big time. I, I mean, here's, here's what I like to look at. I, and I always try and think if it's me looking at the policy, if I'm interested, um, is the guaranteed rate, this is typically where the, the pain point is, the guaranteed rate of 4% is being dropped. So people that want to lock in that higher guarantee, that's the appeal there. Anytime you look at a, a guaranteed rate, a dividend rate, whatever it is with an insurance product, that's a gross rate that's credited after the insurance expenses and such. What I want to look at is the net internal rate of return on a product. So one of the things that we, we do for people, and we've, we've got some content on this as well, is show them what the old product and the new product looks like, guaranteed, non-guaranteed, net internal rate of return, actual cash values based on a guaranteed and non-guaranteed basis. It's a lot of additional work, but, but that's okay. I mean, it's someone's money that they're putting into a policy, so you wanna give them all of the time that they, they need or want, um, but that's, that's what we'll do to really try and alleviate the confusion. Just take the extra steps so they see everything and know, okay, I don't have to ask any extra questions or think, man, I should have asked that beforehand. Like that's what we want to prevent on the client side. Got it. So yeah. would you say your process just for the time being for the next few months yeah. is when you get a new prospect comes in brand new to the concept uh, and they want to say, hey, I want to throw in 50 grand, I want to throw in 100 grand, I want to throw in 25 grand, whatever the number is, are are your you and your agents designing the uh, old design and the new design and they're like boom here it is um here's what's going yeah. like if you take your mm -hmm. time because i know I, I most of my clients take their time because yeah. i almost encourage it i'm like you know what let's do some homework let's do some research. so like most of my clients are probably not going to put a policy in 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 a rush for yeah. keeping the guarantee like if if that's their mindset i try not to let that be a selling point on my end because that may or may not be uh good at the end of the day because right they technically mm -hmm. wasn't ready for it anyways but they were like no i just want to get it in <laughs> now at the end of the day i'm like hey this is you and at the, and if we design a flexible policy where you only have to pay in the base premium of, of four five six seven k but you have a desire to dump in 70 then and you're cool with that 
well then yeah let's get it in now if you want to maintain the the guarantees because you can add in more funds at leisure through throughout the year you know so mm -hmm. hey kevin why not use an iul the same way um well we can definitely get into an iul on a on a, on a separate video separate conversation i think i want to focus on the the updates that are occurring specifically for whole life insurance policies because if i'm not mistaken these updates are not technically um uh, steve's gonna help me correct me on this but iuls already have a guarantee floor of between zero 0 0.5 maybe one percent maybe a little higher i've never seen over i've never seen a a guarantee on the iul over one percent so if it's out there let me know but from zero to one percent so i don't think that's changing at all iuls already had their updates actually throughout the year where there was a couple of i think lawsuits filed from the state of new york there was a couple of articles that um new york uh, actually put out warning their residents and others to be aware of iul policies because of the the internal risk of the high cost exploding so there, there you know there's that but um if i'm not mistaken these changes don't necessarily totally affect iuls in terms of the guaranteed rates because the guarantees are already at that zero percent floor or one percent or half a percent the the changes that i am aware of iuls earlier this year and maybe even last year is when you are being illustrated an index universal life insurance policy when an agent is showing you an illustration they can no longer show the the multipliers that are in there and they can no longer illustrate a rate of return over seven percent or over six and a half if i'm not mistaken from what i've been seeing the policies that i've gotten designed for me uh, that was through Pacific Life, NLG, uh, Allianz, uh, I think Mutual of Omaha, if I'm not mistaken. Couple, A lot of different designs I've been looking at. All of them, according to the agent I spoke with, were illustrating a very conservative 5.5% or 5%, where an IUL could have the potential to actually do 20 25%. 21%, 17%, 12%, but you can't illustrate that anymore. Or or there's certain things that you can no longer illustrate. So I know those changes already are are in force, already happening. So that's why we're just gonna stick to what's what's happening here. Mark Swede, hello. For those with underlying health conditions, can you set up a reasonable policy for an underage child or uh, uh, ex-spouse? Yes, if I am the father, and I have a, a wife or ex-wife, kids, I can insure those people. There's insurable interest. So we can absolutely do that. Denver, brand new, looking for a policy. Great, you're in the right place. Lynetta says, have a policy in place, but I want to write with you on the next one. Okay, that's awesome. Derek Williams says, I have a policy with IBC. Wonderful. Colleen, fully immersed. Sharon, our first time on Denzel Live event. Hello, hello. Danielle, been watching your videos, uh, uh, trying to get myself set up so I could start a policy. Wonderful. Tim, just started my policy two months ago. Getting ready to chunk my first mortgage payment. So excited to pay it off. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, uh, video says, into the third year, trying to use policy for all banking on monthly basis now. Just got a first position HELOC. Wonderful. Want to use this with my policy. Need some guidance. Okay, cool. We'll, we'll get there. We'll have conversations. Cool. Uh, somebody was asking about the MEC limit. Yeah, Denver says, what is MEC space? modified endowment contract max space is the amount of money that we are allowed to overfund the life insurance policy that that limit typically can be a little overinflated so if i want to put in a hundred thousand dollars into a policy my mech limit might be a hundred ten thousand or maybe a hundred thirty thousand depending on how long we go or how short we go so that mech space prevents the policy from becoming a mech becoming a taxable event that's typically the goal if your concern is uh, a tax-free growth uninterrupted compound interest uh, liquidity and you don't want to get hit with with taxes in the later years now there's there's people that design policies with the intent 
to create a mech because even when you create a mech, the death benefit is still paid out tax free. And so I spoke with an agent recently over at the Money Advantage is, is their YouTube channel. And he was saying when I designed IULs, um, I actually, for some clients, we intentionally create a mech because the the gains are gonna keep growing and the, and the death benefits can keep going up, but they have no intent on using the money, the cash value, and they're just gonna collect the humongous tax-free transfer of wealth that takes care of their state taxes, state planning, and any other expenses or debts or whatever the case may be. So that is is sometimes a, a strategy. Where would you like to pick up? <laughs> So I just went through some Q&A with the clients, uh, um, clients and subscribers come back to we were going over the deadlines on when you can put the policy in place. So yeah. we said Guardian was 1231 Mass Mutual. What's the deadline for them? So Mass Mutual, their deadline to start a policy, all companies to start a policy is 1231. But the last date to submit an application is November 19th with Mass Mutual. Okay. November 19th. Perfect. So what that means is if you want a policy with Mass Mutual and you want to lock in the 4% guarantee as a potential policyholder, I would need to just submit an application on or before 1119. Doesn't lock me into the product. I don't have to move forward, but it gives me the option to select the product with the 4% guarantee if I wanted it specifically with Mass Mutual. Okay. <clears throat> Then uh, New York Life. So New York Life's application deadline is November 5th. Okay. Does that just mean got to submit the application? Does it mean underwriting? Just submit the application. Correct. Which, which technically would start the underwriting process, but it doesn't force you or lock you into starting a policy or anything like that. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. We got some cool comments coming in. People saying, yay. Well, we, got, we can see now. Perfect. Sorry, right, guys. <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. You know, this is part of the process of, of you know, with technology advancing and collabs. I love it. Um, all part of it. So, all right. So we got those deadlines. Those are good things to know. We spoke about the current designs with the current policy, 40 year old male, 2.8 million death benefit, putting in a hundred grand a year is at that 4%. If, if the guarantee dropped to 3%, their death benefit would drop by $750,000, putting the same amount of money. And then if, it, uh, if the guarantee drops to 2%, then it's only $1.5 million to put in 100K. Now, the follow-up question that I have to that is, what if that 40-year-old male has even more money to put in, but initially only qualified for the hundred grand at the 2.8 million, what would be the uh, uh, estimated, or if, if you know this, what would be the amount of money I can put in with the new guarantees, new uh, updates starting 22, with a 2.8 million death benefit, how much money can I put into that policy? Oh, I got you. Yeah. So it's about a 40% increase. Depends on the guarantee, of course. Um, so the, it's all relative to the guaranteed rate. So okay. for example, if you had a 2% guarantee. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do the 2%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So just to kind of cut it in half, you'll notice one from 2.8 to about 1.5. It was almost cut in half. When you look at the numbers, it's very close. So what that means is if you said, okay, if I were to take the same $2.8 million death benefit out, with a 2% guarantee, that would give you a MEC limit of about 180 grand. Does so, that mean I can put in 180,000 or a little bit? Okay. Yeah, it does. So that's a good question actually. The because I know with certain companies, you can, you know, put in yep. right up to the MEC limit, others you can't. Depends on the, the PUA flexibility of the carrier and their limitations, right. like with the policy design. Yeah. How much will they allow you to pay in PUAs and such? All companies have different limits there. Yeah. And that's yeah. also only true for a certain amount of time. Correct? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like maybe seven years or 10 years, 14 years, something like that. Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. Let me know if this is kind of what you're yeah, getting uh, at. 
This, yeah. this is solid. Right. This is what I was getting at. So now if you were to compare, I guess this would be essentially apples to apples comparison, because what you're saying is on a 40 year old male, 2.8 million current policy, 100K a year with a 4% guarantee. That is a totally maximized policy. But under the new MEC laws, if the interest rate dropped all the way to 2% and the death benefits 1.5 million, putting in 100 grand, that's technically not an apples to apples comparison because you're not fully maximizing the 100 grand uh, for, for what you could essentially get approved for or what you already got approved for, which was 2.8 million in 2021 and in 2022. In order to maximize a hundred grand, you want to have that death benefit all the way down to 1.5 million for maximum cash value performance. But if we're talking, well, what is the most amount of money I can put in for 2.8 million, same death benefit, but now I have a higher amount, 180 grand. If you were to compare funding 180,000 compared to the person that's putting in 100,000, same age, same death benefit. I'm, I'm curious to know at what point would the 180, you know, overtake in terms of an internal performance? I'm assuming right off the bat, but yeah, yeah. Uh, that's where yeah. I get curious that right, that right there gets exciting for me because I know I've got certain clients in certain situations where they wanted to put in more money, but they couldn't because of what they qualified for in death benefit and then their age with the multiplier. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So your question is, if I can put more money in now, will that will that boost the internal rate of return and the new one can potentially make more sense than the old one? Or am I a little off there? That right there. You just summed okay. it up in like one sentence. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Thanks for laying out all the details. So IRR performance. So it's really interesting about the IRR. So many people are attracted to this. This is what really drives the corporate model as well. And if anyone wants to see that again, just let me know, I can scroll back up. But when you look at the internal rate of return, um, the total death benefit and MEC limit will have an impact. Like if I overinflate that a little bit, but really what's going to drive that internal rate of return on a guaranteed and non-guaranteed basis. And I'm speaking to actual performance, not just illustrated, really comes down to the policy design. And whatever multiplier an insurance company offers via the premium and PUA rider, pretty simple. The more money we get toward the PUA rider, the more money you stuff into cash value, the greater that internal rate of return will be especially when you look at actual performance, not just projections. So the MEC limit has an impact because it's going to measure your total death benefit and have a cost. But really the key driver is this guy right here, which is the actual policy design. There we go. I see. Does that make sense? Questions on that? You know, that's, that's clear. Um, please keep, yeah, continue with that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then that's where you just where the questions typically typically come up, like what are the limits? Because all all companies have different limitations, right? If you take I and mean, we spitball a couple companies and their limits as mutual, the maximum limit or what their language states or what they they won't reject, I should put it this way, <laughs> is in respect to the total payment, whatever your base premium is, that times 10, 10 X. Uncle G. Yep. Yep. So what that would mean is, for example, and this is specific to Mass Mutual here in this example, if I had a $10,000 base premium, their limits would allow a maximum of another 90,000 in PUAs. Granted, there's a term rider in there as well, but it's whatever the base is that is specific to Mass Mutual, what they look at. It's a clean 1090 split. Where the max limit is also like just over 100k correct you could actually set the the mech limit higher if you wanted to some people like to over inflate it a bit if they want to pay in for a long period of time um right. but yeah in an ideal world if you said juice the irr i want to max fund this policy as much as i can shrink the the mech limit down to 100k i'm going to fund it for 10 years or less that that's how you would do it yeah 
Now, in this in this case, under the new mech laws in the 7702 updates, with if if someone, let's say we got that 40 year old male that only has a hundred grand, but now they come across this information, they're like, well, I'm 40, I plan on 10xing my income. I'm 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 part of the Grant Cardone 10x community. I'm I'm building a business. I want to start with a hundred. But I would like the ability to go as high as up to 180,000. Mm -hmm. So at that point, would it make sense to have a higher base premium to support that? So they would initially take a, a, a hit because it's not quite a uh, 1090 split. So you're not quite maximizing the cash, but they're maximizing their long-term capability of, of putting money in for a long period of time. So mm -hmm. therefore, if they're saying, you know what, I plan on funding this policy for 50 years, you know, all the way up yep. until I'm 90 years old, I want to fund it for as long as humanly possible. And I want to get in as much as humanly possible or have the ability to get in as much as humanly possible. Under yep. the laws, this would favor them. Um, it, it would, and you can actually do the exact same thing too. Really good question. Where if you said, "Hey, I want to be able to pay in 180 per year," the Mass Mutual's premium and PUA limits are identical. So if I have a higher MEC limit and can go up to 180, and someone said, "Hey, like I want maximum IRR," what we would do is set that base premium at 18,000. Then they can pay up to a total of 180 per year. You don't have to. We could overinflate the MEC limit a little bit if they wanted to as well, but it would all be relative just from a, a policy design standpoint. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. good. Really yeah. good. All right. So just to recap for the audience, for the 50 plus people watching, we've gone over uh, uh, the main 7702 update, which is the guarantees. We went over, you know, we did a little comparison of on a 40 year old male putting in 100K. Um, we went over the deadlines for the for the big companies. Do you know of any other deadlines? Like, let's say you know Guardian Mass New York wasn't an option, right? What would be your next your next best pick? Would it be a Penn Mutual? Uh, would it be a Mutual Trust Security Mutual? Um, do you know of any of those competitors that um, are? Good question. We don't. We can write all the small carriers. We don't use them a whole lot. Just going back to the actual data, like wh where we started with the what corporations look at. Um, Penn, I mean, they're making the the most moves I've seen just among all the smaller smaller carriers with a dedicated effort to whole life insurance. Um, yeah. That has nothing to do with their illustrations. That's just from talking to them and their their head actuary a couple times. So they're cut off. Um, they didn't. They stated it, but it didn't say with pure certainty. Their um, memo stated all applications should be be submitted by November 5th. Um, they didn't state they had to be, they said should be. So I always like that, you know, extreme clarity when we're getting this kind of information. So you, for now you can use the November 5 deadline, but I would put a little yeah. star, star next to it. Yeah, because you know, I've got a ton of viewers that have policies with Penn, uh, mm -hmm. Transamerica, uh, mutual of Omaha security mutual. Um, so, you know, I always like to, you know, give that feedback as well with them that are, that have the smaller policies, if they're looking at putting a policy in place with, with them as well, uh, just mm -hmm. so that they're, they're aware. So you could, we can make a safe assumption that the deadlines are going to be very comparable or similar to what mass New York guardian is, is doing as well. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Now, can we also go into insurance costs? Like what makes it favorable? What yeah. does it mean? Okay, insurance costs are going down and, and the loan Here's rates are going down. And so right, let's go into that a little bit. I feel like that'll help people really understand the, uh, yeah. the guarantees and the internal rate of returns. Yep. So the best way to look at like look at that to know, hey, what's the cost? Because formulas that break down the costs for insurance companies can be a bit complicated, just to, to say the least. So what I like to look at is, all right, if I'm looking to pay money into a product, what is my actual cash value growth? Use the term internal rate of return, which is how much is actually growing by year over year. And it simplifies things from a consumer's perspective. 
And what's good to do, what's, what has helped a lot of people is looking at the old product. So here we have a, a sample, 100 per year for five years going in. Mm -hmm. This is based on present dividend values. Right. Old product, which has a guaranteed rate of 4%. This is Guardian. And then the new product, which has a guaranteed rate, 3%. Now the dividend rate with both of these examples is 5.65%. What do you notice about the death benefits? Big difference. Correct. All right. But look at that. Mech limits stay the same. Mech limits the same. So what the purpose of this model was really to show an apples to apples comparison when someone says, hey, I want to see the difference between a new product and the old product just to have transparency and know what option is truly in my best interest. So what we've got here is if you before I look at the numbers, actually, what I want to touch on the difference with dividends <clears throat> is if I have a 5.65% dividend, which I do. With the old product, I have a guaranteed rate of 4%. This means that the company declared a surplus of 1.65%. Anytime you see a dividend column on a life insurance illustration, that is a representation of the surplus only. And that can be confusing because if we take this example, I'm just going to draw here quick. This is Guardian. We can look at a mass one too. If you were to Google search Guardian's dividend interest rate right now, what would pop up? You might be doing it. 5.65%. <laughs> that would show up on Google. So that would tell me as a consumer, when I look at a life insurance illustration, and see the annual dividend column, what should that represent? I would think 5.65%. Right. However, it does not. And this causes so much confusion. I wish it was different in the industry, but it's not for a number of reasons. It only reflects the surplus. And why I like to mention that is for those that like to crunch the numbers, like CFOs at corporations say, hey, what's going on here? This doesn't add up. That's exactly why. <laughs> so go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. So one thing that that comes up when we're looking at what what we're seeing right here, what you've presented here, um, you know, I've, I've you know me, I spend a lot of time looking at other competitors, see what other agents are saying, see how they're presenting things. Yeah. And one thing that comes up quite a bit is the validity of what we're looking at right now. Like, how, <laughs> how do I know that what Steve did here, this is an Excel doc where it shows annual IRR, average IRR, death benefits and stuff like that. Um, I, I feel like what can like how can the client, the viewer believe what they're looking at right now? What what? calculations are you using is this something you're pulling directly from the guardian software mass mutual software i feel yeah. like that is is something that comes up from the other side from the competitors and i was like you know what let's you know let's settle it let's uh provide that transparency and see you know how is steve operating because from my view this is very helpful uh yeah. to kind of get these summarized columns so I can really understand what the heck I'm looking at because when I get my contract, I don't necessarily see these columns on my policy contract. Or if I do, I don't even know where to look for it. I think that's yeah. what the client says. That's what the prospect or if a client is looking at other, working with yeah. an agent, they're like, every time I've spoken to my clients, they're like, no other agent is doing what, what Steve's doing. Um, okay. with, well, yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. No, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of that, but no, I mean, I would, I would wonder the same thing. So anyone that works with us, I mean, we've got a, an entire team that works on taking all the data from the direct illustrations and then importing it onto Excel. Just our, in our mission statement, we aim to provide transparency, but then also convenience. So it's, it's several steps on the back end, And that's why we've hired a number of people to try and get the, the convenience piece out quickly. 
But here's just a quick sample I put together for, for someone this morning. He wanted to see 60K per year going in. I'll show you mass mutual and guardian samples. But just to kind of summarize here, like how I would explain it to him or any of our agents would is, here is a detailed illustration. This example is with mass. where you have got 60K per year going in. In this example, up until age 50. And we ran the same product with the same design for five, 15, and 30 years. This way he can see, hey, if I'm not sure how long I wanna pay into it right now, I can pivot as I go. Mass is a company that will allow that. So we've got the 60K going in. Where's the money going? Premium. Can identify that by the base policy insurance column. So as low as Mass Mutual will allow in this example, I can show you Guardian next. Then we've got two PUA riders, really just to maximize the flexibility, but Lisser, life insurance supplement rider with that 6,000 there, you'll see this face amount here. It's a combination of money going toward PUAs and a term rider. So a blended PUA or a one-year term rider. And we do like to run the full breakdown as well so people can see the cost. But here, at his age, it's going to be something like 450 bucks or so. Uh -huh. But then everything else is just plowing into PUAs. Got it. Here's your money column. There's your break even. 301, 401. And why don't we do this actually? Thanks for asking that question, Denzel. If we look at this guy, so when we import it all into Excel, the values match up identical. Right. Because literally what we do is just take all the info and export it on Excel. Because think, if I'm a consumer, like this was something I struggled with in the early days, is if I want to see something like what, what we just had up here, this guy, plus funding it for five years, plus funding it for 15 years. And then I want to see the same thing with another company and maybe two products. I mean, that turns in very, very quickly the six to sometimes up to 12 individual illustrations. Right. Which you have so, to open up with 12 different tabs. Correct. And imagine if you're a consumer trying to go through all that. Very tough. Right. It's a lot. So how I view it is you still want to be compliant from a from an industry standpoint and provide all the detail. So you probably saw it there is this is all in a zip file. So when I send it to someone, it's going to be in two zip files there, uh -huh. like the mass mutual illustrations and then the guardian illustrations. But then also what I'll do is export all of it, literally just peel it from the software, from the illustrations and drop it onto Excel and that's it. And then people can cross reference it. I'll do it. If I'm going over it via presentation, all our agents do too. But I mean, yeah, we just make it easy for them. That's what we're aiming to do. Perfect. It is extra work. I mean, I will say that. And I'm not saying that as a say, Hey, we do all this extra work. It's just, it can take extra time. Um, but again, it's, it's, you know, for the convenience yeah. factor of the individual. Cool. So I got a really cool comment that came up, um, which is where this comes from. So Ronald uh, Venter says, where in the policy contract do you find the guaranteed rate of return or internal rate of return explicitly stated on the cash value and, and policy as a, as a whole, um, yeah. which is now we so you've made it very clear for the first three columns and age, you're pulling it right from the illustration. So that's yep. for transparency. Now that annual IRR column, yep. how do I validate that from the yeah company is that a formula you're personally doing uh, so no. the annual yeah good question so the annual IRR we've got a formula for that and then insurance companies will also provide it so what I can do and we do this frequently is actually run an additional report so the annual IRR or if it's mass mutual they call it cash value ROR rate of return Mm -hmm. That's for their annualized IRR. So then you'll actually get an additional PDF report that represents or displays those those figures on the full illustration. And then we just peel those out, put them right on the Excel sheet. And then for the average IRR, I do not have a formula for that just because it's a little difficult, <laughs> especially if you're stopping funding. So all insurance companies do provide that. So this one does not have it on it. Just because when we put average IRRs on a spreadsheet from an insurance carrier, 
What I have to do with that, um, especially if it's mass mutual, is it is generated on the full PDF. So what we'll do is take that PDF and then convert it to Excel, then clean it up and take the average IRRs, put them on Excel. This way, a consumer doesn't have to flip through a number of pages. They can cross cross reference and we do it for them, too. But to answer the question, we pull it directly from the insurance carrier as well. Those internal rate of return reports can be run via the illustration. It's pretty simple. I mean, you have to click a button. It does make the PDF go from typically 19 to 20 pages to sometimes 30 pages. If you look at the guarantees, it's going to be close to 50 pages. So then you have to really just clean it up and put it all in an Excel sheet properly. It takes time. <laughs> That's the best way to answer it. Yeah, but well worth it. So I really appreciate you going through that because I, I um, you know, I've, I've heard that from other uh, uh, influencers in this space and also very just curious clients like, hey, this is great, but how do I validate this? How do I how do I trust what I'm looking yeah. at? And I think that, you know, provides more honesty. We're able to have a really good dialogue and be transparent, be effective with our with our time. So just to recap on a couple of things, we've gone over the guarantees. Those are changing. We've gone over the deadlines. Um, I want to touch on insurance costs coming down. What exactly is is dropping? Because we do see like on the 40 year old right there. Yeah that the 2.8 million and now it's seven hundred fifty thousand dollars less that 750k is that coming from whole life based premium term writer pua you know like or is it a mix of all three mm -hmm. um, you can dive into that a little bit and i know i know we're we're running short on on time just because we had yeah. that, those those delays earlier but yeah that's something we, i definitely want to cover <laughs> we can go longer too just because in light of that delay i don't want to shortchange people because of my stupid technology <laughs> um so what happens right so with that lower cost the base premium is the same and i can actually you might i'll email, email myself an illustration on this and walk through this one too so everybody can see it um but what happens is when i design these policies you've got the same base premium and with a new product, it purchases purchases one the same base premium, a lesser whole life death benefit. Then I'll also attach a term rider, which needs to be less and less as well. So I've got a lower expense with the new product. I need less life insurance. That's why it's costing me less naturally, especially the term term rider cost. But here's what I want to look at really to break down the costs. So if we look at the annualized and average IRRs. So to touch on the individual's question before as well, the average IRR, like how we get this, is if we pull up the detailed illustration, this will all match, it'll be identical, literally, because we just pulled the values from the illustration and put it right onto Excel. Um, and anyone that works with us knows that too. So as we look at this, there's your annualized IRR, there's your average IRR, based on the present dividend values, and this again is the new product, just to be very clear here. If you notice about that year five dividend, when you look at both of them, big difference. What does that dividend column represent again? The, the base, right? Surplus, surplus only. Surplus, yep, right. got it. Yeah, meaning the guaranteed piece is not included in there. If that's confusing to anyone, and I'm gonna get right back on track here, but what you can look at here, is look at your cash value growth just right here. It's about 27 grand. Yeah. Yet the dividend is not 27. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. So to simplify without digging into the weeds there, the guaranteed piece is not included in that dividend column. Okay. Now, getting back to the costs and really what to look for from a consumer's from the consumer's end is the guarantees I'm sorry, is the internal rate of return. So if you look at the average, let's look at that just at year 20 here. It's the new product on the right. There you have it on the right, what you have on the left. Right, what I'm seeing is a higher rate of return internally, yet my guarantee is lower. How on earth did that occur? Is what the client's gonna say. Yep. And so our answer as agents is the cost of insurance mm -hmm. has a big effect. The death benefit has a big effect to how the cash 
value performs filming. So it, it, it does the other piece too. It's a good point you mentioned. The other piece is when you look at how insurance companies credit the surplus piece and the guaranteed piece, there is a difference there. Okay. Where from a performance standpoint, whether it's credited on base premium or PUA dollars, the surplus, there's definitely more, there is more upside there. You can kind of see it here. So these are identical designs, right? So minimum premium, maximum PUA allocation, like we design everything. But as we look at it over time, you've got a higher dividend column here because that dividend column represents a 2.65% surplus, whereas this one, 1. 165. Mm -hmm. Questions at all on that? Yeah, so what's happening with the new product is because there's less money of my hundred grand going to cost, that that difference in cost goes into the surplus dividend, the non-guarantees, which is resulting in net higher cash value, even though in the beginning I have less cash value to start with. Mm -hmm. Right. And the reason for that lesser cash value up front is is for what reason? Yeah. So this is actually so this is specific to Guardian. The reason why we have lesser cash value and this is just Guardian's product is what Guardian did. Is their PUA fee for years has been five percent So the old product. At the 5% PUA fee, the new one, the 10% PUA fee. Ah, okay. So it increased by 50%. It, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I got gotcha. you. I do that all the time. <laughs> yeah. So they doubled that. Um, and the reason why, that actually is in line with more competitors uh, with those PUA rider fees. Yeah, because Mass Mutual is at about an 8 or 9, correct? Correct. Their Lister piece is at eight, and then their Ailer piece, their two PUA riders, their Ailer's at seven and a half presently. Yeah. Um, and their numbers are staying the same. Correct. They did not adjust okay. their PUA riders, at least not yet with a 10 pay product. Their new products um, will have access to those shortly in about a week and a half. Yeah. Um, but the whole purpose of a high PUA fee, how an insurance company will describe it to one is A, it's meant to enhance long-term performance because it can give potential there. The company has more money to work with in the beginning, but then two, and this is just more of a concern guardians had for a long period of time. Um, it prevents people from just stuffing money into a policy, call it for four or five years and then turning around and trying to cash it out. Not many people we work with do that, but that does happen in the industry. So that's a big reason they had increased that PUA fee to kind of discourage people just from using their general account for a short period of time and then pulling their money out. <laughs> yeah, and to get even deeper into that, because I've been doing a little homework on that, uh, as well as taking my uh, AML uh, uh, course, I've uh, seen that there's a, there's a higher focus and attention because this is a very regulated industry, just so that the client and the viewers understand that there is a reason why um, people do that and it's not always for the most ethical reasons so if we can go over the bad stuff there's money laundering drug trafficking uh, <laughs> you name it, all the all the bad stuff and you know what i found very interesting uh that just kind of blew my mind here is the fact that you know when you look at the the, the evil right that's in the world the drug traffickers the sex traffickers the cartels the, the drug operators they understand the value of high cash value life insurance to the point that they're willing to move all of that evil money into this high performing account. So even the bad guys see <laughs> this as a as a great product. Yet the average Joe everyday American is like, this is a scam because they're yeah. told by other influencers. Yet you've got the bad guys and you've got the, you know, good companies, good co corporations. You've got banks that are feeding into this design. And so it just like, it, it rattled my mind there. I was just like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. They're 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 money laundering yeah. where they, they move money into these 
accounts and then they do that surrender charge yep. after a couple of years they kill it uh so that that money is now clean money and it gets pumped back into legitimate other businesses that produce cash flow Co that's money Correct. laundering 101 it's it's there's there's a layering system and then there's placement and integration and it gets very very funny you know at a point where it gets uh, a little scary but those people that's why so when you see the insurance companies making those switches, that's another reason why, because they, they know evil's out there um, and they're trying to maintain as a good, reputable company. And the last thing they want is to be a part of that operation. It, I yeah. It, and they catch that kind of stuff too. I mean, we've had calls with head of legal departments on that, on that specific topic. And it's, it's interesting to know like how they really can identify that. And then when they ask for validation, um, yeah, that stuff goes on. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, touch on that. And again, providing that honest feedback, honest information, truthful yeah. stuff that people be like, oh, wow. And that might be the the turning point. Someone, find, you know, finally clicks the concept, the strategy and, and that stuff. So, yeah. All right. So we are, we are doing so good, by the way. I, I, I'm getting a lot of good feedback in the comments. Um, what, and we're, we're why don't, yeah. If you'd like kind of on the cost point too, because when you look at a, a non-guaranteed illustration with this new change across the board, illustrations will look better, non-guarantees long-term. But what I just want to stress here, it's still going to be a, a good product, but the whole reason this change happened is insurance companies feel that the low interest rate environment, as far as assets they can acquire that will remain competitive, so call it just interest rates, are going to remain low for at least 10 years. And their direct fear is, we will not be able to raise our dividend rates for that time period. Meaning there's a good chance they're going to come down a little bit. Okay. So- Which they have in the last three years since I've had- Correct. Yeah, correct. And, and this is this is why they lobbied for the change too. So with that said, to know, okay, while the non-guaranteed numbers look better, long-term that is, as I look at it say, okay, yes, they look better right now, but what is the likelihood that they will continue to look better if I run things more conservative? So what we do then, and we do this the same way as we pull everything from the detailed illustrations. The guarantees take a lot of time. Like, and I know this is live, I would not promote this on a, a YouTube video because I don't like to talk about myself or you know come off as bragging. I, I don't like that kind of stuff. Um, when we put this stuff together, when I do it, it usually takes three or four hours just to go through it, cross-reference it because it's running the illustrations. And the real pain is taking PDFs having to convert them to Excel or manually plug in the numbers and then double check them, triple check them. Like that's, that's where it takes a lot of time um, when we put all this stuff together. You must be a nerd with insurance if you really want to do that. Right. <laughs> all right. I'm gonna build a career in this. Now's the time, Now's the time <laughs> yeah. to be a nerd in the 21st century. There you go, with life insurance, right? <laughs> huh? So these are guaranteed values only. So no dividends. Now, as we look at this, this is Guardian. We can look at Mass 2. We run every scenario you can imagine. Um, because this is Guardian, you've got a lower guarantee. Then also that PUA fee is 10% in this example. Whereas over here, it's five. Now keep in mind that the PUA fees are gross. You'll never see that dollar amount, the five or 10% actually deducted. The IRR will help paint some accuracy there yeah but but here's where you really see the difference so irrs annual and average with the stronger guarantee and again all things being equal apples to apples so looking at these values gotcha we're now looking at guaranteed no dividend surplus correct and yep. we see how the old product is showing a stronger uh, internal rate of return just off the guarantees, which makes sense. Correct. Okay. And here's something I'll add, you know, the whole idea of copying the people that have already figured it out, right? So if you speak with a business owner that 
generates 100 million per year revenue revenue you want to sit there and pick his brain as much as possible right take him out for dinner order the the steak that takes the longest to cook so you can talk to him more right? and just really absorb everything you can from him yeah from an informational standpoint because he's figured it out and then you can save time by learning from him or her why i mention that is when we work with people as an individual recently puts in about 400,000 per year and he has industry experience. He knows the industry in and out. He's actually been in the industry since I was born, literally 1988 is when he got into the business, um, but knows it inside out. And he asked the questions that corporations ask. So when he sits, when he has his policy with 400,000 per year going in, he says, show me guaranteed, non-guaranteed and midpoint values as well midpoint values what that means is a, a dividend rate that assumes between the guaranteed and current non-guaranteed rate that way you've got transparency see a conservative rate as well like you can do that stuff it takes more time but like that's the kind of questions the heavy hitters ask because they know what to ask um so we want to know that too or work with someone that will kind of ask for you so you don't kind of say oh man like nobody ever told me that <laughs> that makes sense no, it's good. <laughs> really good. Okay. So now oh, my mind is running, racing. I got so many questions that I want to get into, <laughs> but I got limited time with the one and only Steve. So what, I, what I'm going to do is dive into some Q&A here, uh, okay. just to respect the people that did show up. And I, and for the most part, I did go through quite a bit of the, of the questions already while, while you were uh, trying to fix your camera and stuff. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, so we got a quick question, you know, how long after you start a policy, can you start to withdraw? That's within 10 business days, if I'm not mistaken. Do I have that correct, Steve? C correct. So you can take a loan within 10 business days after starting a policy can be within the first year. But if it is a pure withdrawal, like if not a loan transaction, then you want to wait until after the seventh year because a withdrawal transaction does impact the MEC limit. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. to Appreciate that. Timothy. And yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I <laughs> compliance officers all the time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Can we have an individual chat? Individual chat with Steve. That's from Timothy, and I, I, I want to say yes because you know you've got. I would say you got to jump on on Steve's email newsletter. Uh, you know, go to the website IBC Global. Go to the YouTube channel. Um, you know, mention my name that you got connected <laughs> through the always mentioned Denzel's name yeah and, uh they're gonna take good care of you you can have conversations and it's it's really effective uh for the long term I got Andre in the house I'm familiar with this gentleman it says explain the difference of of the payout which you did go over between base and PUA right which we can touch on that again his follow-up is is, is uh, you know also explain the difference of payouts between base and PUA for higher interest rate environments, right? So we're in a low interest rate environment and we are likely to stay there for a, a period of time according to what the insurance companies are doing. There's a reason why they are doing what they're doing because they foresee something we don't, right? Yeah. And so I guess it would be wise you know, to listen to the Ray Dalios of the world, the, the Carl Icons, the Warren Buffetts, you know, to, to see what what they're getting access to that everyday people aren't necessarily. And how can we at least just, you know, be aware, keep an eye out. Um, so I, I like that question a lot because that's going to lead me into policy design. We're going to wrap it up with policy design. Um, so if you can mm -hmm. touch back on that part, that'd be great. Just difference between yeah. PUA cool. and base payout in a mm -hmm. low interest rate environment today, but then also in a high interest rate environment. Yeah, definitely. So when you look at an insurance company's breakdown of how they credit dividends, so not the guaranteed rate, dividends to a policy, there is a difference. So if you do want to contact me, Boom. make sure you match Dell's name there, but that, all, that always works. So with the policy, We've got premium. Oops, I'm not used to this board. There we go. It's a different board. <laughs> and then we've got the PUA piece. If we take a company, let's say you have a dividend rate right now of 
And just to keep this simple, I'll use the current guaranteed rate of 4%. Okay. Yeah, doesn't really matter. When you pay money into a product on the topic of policy design, in respect to your cash value, the premium hurts us in particular in the first year or the first and second year. The reason why the company is going to overcharge the policyholder for the death benefit up front. Whereas PUA dollars show up in cash value. Tell I wasn't an art major. But that's money you can access right away, it begins to earn the guaranteed rate and also the surplus. Here's the thing though. So if I have this total dividend of 6%, with a guaranteed rate of four, that means I have a surplus of two. When you actually break down an illustration, I wanna emphasize that word illustration, the guaranteed piece is applied in the same manner to premium and PUA dollars, meaning the formulas that insurance carriers use in respect to their guaranteed crediting rate is the same on any money you pay toward base premium dollars and toward PUA dollars. The surplus rate, however, is applied on both, but it definitely favors the base premium. For example, if we were to look at an illustration with a 1090 compared to a 50-50 design, the 50-50 design on the dividend column, which again represents the surplus, we touched on that earlier, will project much higher dividends. So I believe the, the follow-up question that Andre asked is, hey, in a high dividend interest rate, let's say dividends go back up to 8%, that means in this case, I would have a surplus of 4%, so a higher base premium could potentially result in greater long-term cash value. Is that kind of the, the question? And if he wants to, if he's in the chat box and confirming, I just want to make sure I'm on the right, on, on the same I, page. Yeah, I want to say you're on the, on the right track there. I guess a, a question I have is if I were to start a policy in a very low interest yeah. rate and environment, as well as a low guarantee environment of two to, to 3.75%, um, does my policy have the potential of creating a mech if rates go up in my, in my favor? I, I would think, you know, when, if a dividend increases, the company now declares a higher dividend after so many years, does that speed up my cash value growth to the death benefit? And can that be an issue later on? Good question. Um, so I can answer that quickly and we can come back to it as well after we hit on this point. But um, the quick answer is no, if dividend rates go up, the MEC risk actually decreases. The reason why is yes, your cash value increases faster, but so does your death benefit. So when you look at the long-term MEC test on a life insurance policy, and it's possible to forecast this, what do you've got or where it really becomes challenging is beyond the first seven years. And where people have run into mechs, where they were sold a policy based on an illustration that said your policy will not mech, and then 10, 15 years down the road, they got a warning saying, hey, in year 18, if you, can if you continue on your path that you started with day one, you're going to run into a mech. The reason, the specific reason why that happens is when you look at that original illustration, the death benefit was appreciating based on the client's payments and the present dividend rate illustrated at that time. So I'm, if I'm going to lean into it, I'm going to write present dividend. Dividends have come down for a significant period of time, several decades when you really look at it. So if the dividend comes down, you'll have less cash value, but what else will you have less of? Death benefit death benefit and what has a direct relationship to the MEC limit? Death benefit, right? Correct. So it's a good question. I'm not sure who asked it, but it's a really good question. If dividends go up, it's actually the opposite where that risk starts to go away because you don't have to worry about it at all. But mm -hmm. in any event, it's it's possible to, to stress test. Um, it can take some time. It's fairly simple though. It just takes some time to stress test it. And I hate just saying you can stress test and leave it at that. Sometimes I give too much information. 
To stress test it, what you can do is look at a policy based on a current dividend, but then also like that individual who'd been in the industry for a long time, a midpoint dividend, and then also guarantees. Guarantees. Yeah, and what you want the policy to read is no mech across the board. That's the key right there. Right. Um, yeah. Okay, perfect. You gotta know what you're doing. Like, and I'm not saying that, you know, to say, hey, we know the best, like for anyone in the business, like you do know, need to know how to do that. And you gotta be patient, patient if you're new at it. Yeah, yeah, this is why I defer to the experts uh, or try to find the experts. I try to find um, opposing arguments to poke holes into into my strategy and see, okay, am I doing the right thing for myself and for yeah. when I'm presenting? I, I met I met one person who actually knew about that, um, and I was really really surprised. It was Elizabeth actually the attorney? Yeah. Um, so when I first met her, it was with a couple, a young couple. They do about eighty five million per year in revenue, and we were looking at cash value life insurance policies. And I was explaining to her, and she goes, "Huh, you know, that's actually." good in that point because it avoids a push out, meaning you could run into a mech long term if the policy's not designed. And I asked her, I'm like, are you, you licensed? Like, have you ever been licensed before? <laughs> but no, but she had helped um, AIG develop a, a private placement product years ago. She knows her stuff inside out. Wow. Um, but that's the only other person I met that actually had an understanding on it and didn't just, you know, mention blank terms. Great. Makes sense. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. So this leads to policy design. When I have the, yeah. when I have mm -hmm. new mech laws in in place, yeah. And Andre's got a follow up question. He's like, you know, he says, Steve, how do you feel about convertible term instead of blending? Right. So we can get into that because that that's going to be in alignment with policy design. That's where he's uh, leading us to. Yep. And where I yeah. get where I get really confused as as a financial coach, financial consultant and content creator first, insurance agent second, and then just uh, a, a very curious customer third when I'm when I'm presented with many different ways of implementing this wonderful concept called infinite banking. Um, I've created some parameters for myself and I'm going to take it to my board real quick. That just kind of goes over the, the, yeah. the policy design, uh, strategies in the marketplace today, what currently exist. And what I've come to is you've got people designing 1090 splits and then anywhere up to as high as 40, 60, meaning putting in a hundred grand, my base premium is either going to be $10,000 or as high as $40,000. And that is within the infinite banking uh, uh, parameters of a high cash value life insurance policy for the short term and long term. And then anything past um, 40, 60 is a little iffy to me. I get a little concerned where I'm like, I don't know if I'm, I don't think I'm any longer in infinite banking uh, bounds. I think I'm out of bounds as soon as I go above that. I think a lot of insurance agents would agree with that point. Now, what I what I'd love to touch on because the the 1090 design has become such a hot topic amongst the other uh, content creators that are are traditionally doing the 33 67 split to 40 60 split. Mm -hmm. um, this this 1090 notion really, uh, I would say, combats or uh, really challenges the norm that's out there and makes a lot of people start to question, wait a minute, do I need to sacrifice all this cash value for the hope of a long-term high cash value policy? Beings that I just learned that the guarantees are going down anyways. Yeah. So now that the guarantees are going down and I've been told all this time that base premium dollars pay higher, stronger dividends than the PUAs, which is still a fact according to what we just went over. But what happens when it goes down and then my mech limit capability to add in more funds go up and my insurance cost comes down, which means my 
death benefit comes down. And I, un I understand that with the 40, 60, we're, we're still appreciating the death benefit. But now that I'm in a position where the death benefit has dropped, the guarantees have dropped, the insurance costs has dropped, the loan rates have dropped, the MEC limit's gone up. Does this challenge with these new updates, does this make a conflict or a challenge in terms of the norm design? Is there a happy medium in between? Or or is 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 it the end all be all 1090 is the only way to go? Because I've heard that <laughs> argument as well. I've heard some people say that. And uh, I don't think that's true, that 1090 is the end all be all. And I also think it's not true that 4060 is the end all be all. So yeah. I want to get some clarity around that because that's been rattling my mind. And you know me, I'm always talking to the competitors and other insurance agents. I'm hanging out with them. I'm having conversations, trying to really be a synergist, you know, and just kind of conversate with these people and, you know, have transparent discussions. I don't yeah. like to, you, 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 you've never thrown any shots at anybody. I, I do my best not to throw any shots at anyone. I try to hold that in. And it, even when I do get attacked for my character, the way I look, skin color, I mean, the way I have my setup, I mean, it's, it's, I've mm -hmm. heard it all at this point and I'm only 25 and I've heard it all already. Um, and I'll continue to hear more. But my goal is to be to provide that that synergy level, that synchronization. Hey, got you. Love what you do. I respect you. You're trying to help people. We're we're gonna get to the to the end goal if we treat yeah. the customer right. So that was a, that was a mouthful, and I know we're running out of time. But we're good. Mm -hmm. where where are you at with that? Does does this challenge the way we design policies, or does it stay the same? Good question. So it does not. It actually if cash value like if that is the objective of the consumer design my policy for maximum cash value first death benefit secondary the mech limits have changed a bit but really aside from that when you still look at the the insurance company's premium to pua limitations their capacity and what they're comfortable with that that hasn't changed um and just from the initial analysis we've run there's no difference there um, you'll see a little bit on that dividend column because you've got a higher surplus with a lower guarantee. So a higher base premium should kind of to Andre's earlier point, which I want to make sure we close that, that question too. Um, but that should project greater long-term values because the surplus is more favorable on the base premium piece. But I mean, at the end of the day, to answer your question, when you compare the two, has not really changed um, when you look at that. And to your point, as far as one being the end all be all, I don't know that I agree with that because it really does come down to company design, the company and product design. You know, for example, if I want to maximize the internal rate of return of a life insurance policy and I have a specific goal, which a lot of people do this, of max funding it, <clears throat> excuse me, for 10 years or less, in my experience, I know that Guardian is going to produce among the strongest guaranteed values and non-guaranteed values, actual performance, not just what's on the projection, but that is their sweet spot where I can just juice a policy for 10 years or less, ton of flexibility, commit to the minimum, pour more in at discretion. It's great. If I said I want to be able to pay into a policy for a long period of time, maybe it's 30 or 50 years or something like that or forever till the day I die, you can do it with Guardian, but to really make Guardian favorable there, you need to do a 25-75 split. So it does depend. That's very specific to Guardian. If you want a 1090 because you like the upfront value, you view that as an opportunity cost now, and you want to be able to pay in for a long period of time, give me the best of both worlds. We get that sometimes. Mass can accommodate it with a properly designed policy, stress testing, the mech test, all that good stuff. Like it does depend on those, you know, circumstances. And sometimes clients are very deliberate. They say, that's what I want. Here's what I'd like to see. Show me the different options. And some say, you know, I, I, I'd like to see both. Um, for example, like that sample I, I pulled up earlier, here's an example that just said, hey, I want the ability to pay in 60K per year. And we hadn't had a full conversation yet. Um, I plan to, we do that every time before we start a policy, several conversations is show them both. Like that's what I would want to see as an individual. So we show here's a guardian sample, right? Funding for five years, looking at the guarantees, dividend values, indexed feature, if he wants to see that. Then mass mutual funded for five, 15, 30 years, 
you'll notice they are the exact same product. So I do not need to make any tweaks in the design. He can choose after the fact if he wants the fund shorter or longer, um, but making it very easy for the, the uh, consumer in that respect, but showing different options. If he says, I, I like Guardian for flexibility, can I see that funded for 30 years? That design is going to look different and those upfront cash values will not look as attractive. So it does depend on the situation. And I hate that answer so much. It depends because I feel like it's a, an escape from someone's <laughs> um, question. But at the end of the day, it does depend on their objectives, how long they want to pay into it, and a number of factors. Got it. And so mm -hmm. with that, um, you had mentioned on... 2575 with, with Guardian for long term funding, yet Mass Mutual will allow you to fund for a long period of time on a, on a 1090, Correct. which will require a high term expense cost, I'm assuming. Um, uh, not so good question. Yeah, good, good assumption which, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. which, which leads to Andre's question on convertible term instead yeah. of a uh, annual renewable term. Uh, or mm -hmm. PUA term blend. Yeah. So thanks for, for laying that out in both ways. So two, or first, it doesn't actually require a high term cost just because kind of going back to that dividend test initially, like how you've got this increasing death benefit mm -hmm. to make sure we prevent a mech. We can keep the term rider relatively low. Then we just show the costs guaranteed and non-guaranteed from the get-go. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't result in a high or a heavy additional cost. But to get into the convertible term rider, that's a good option to lock in your health and insurability. The thing I don't like about the convertible term, a lot of people aren't aware of this, is depending on the company, there's going to be some rules that you have that restrict the design of the policy when you convert it. And they're all different. I can give you a couple examples. I kind of give you a standard piece with convertible term is if I start a policy today with full underwriting, and this is not a convertible term, so let's say a new policy, and I'm putting in 10,000 per year, I can design that however I want. It's fully underwritten. I can, if I want a 1090, I can go a thousand there. You can tell I've got OCD when the colors have to be perfect, right? 9,000 there for a total of 10. If I have a convertible term and I convert it down the road, and when I convert it, just to keep things simple, $10,000 per year is my number, I'm gonna be restricted. Um, specifically, what I mean when I say that, is it has to do with, with that new term conversion, a percentage of the, the converted policy can be term. I have to have a higher base face amount, which results often in a higher base premium. A lot of times we see it turn into something like this. Depends on our age, really. Where the lowest I can go in the premium might be 3,500. Sometimes it's higher than that if I'm converting it after five years or something like that. Um, again, it depends on the company, but I definitely want to have awareness on that because that point right there has caused so many people frustration where they say like, okay, here's the kind of design I want. I really like this. I can't do it now. So I'll just do a convertible term. The agent typically doesn't know because insurance companies bury it in their memos as far as what's, what's available with their conversion, um, term conversions. And then it comes time to convert. The agent submits the illustration and then they get a message back saying, you can't do that. The base face amount must be this much. Then they panic because they got to go tell the client, hey, you've got to have a higher base premium. It's not, it's never fun. Um, so, I mean, you have to keep up the speed as far as the different memos and what companies allow. Got it. But my point is you are going to be restricted on that design. So they, they have a place, but it's very important to have awareness there first. I see. I see. And the opposing argument from all the content that I've watched, because <laughs> going back to me, like this just goes to show my, the way I geek out. Um, the opposing argument is that it's safer to do that than a PUA blend because of the added 10 extra sheets of paper on your illustration that goes over the, the, the risk of a lesser or PUA term blend. Can we touch on that? Yeah. So, so I'm not familiar with that argument. When you say additional 
sheets of paper. Um, uh, so like on the illustration, instead of it being uh, eight pages, it's 16. So that actually has to do with the state. Um, you would get those, good question, you would get those additional pages with any premium blend, um, whether it's 100% base, 50-50, 10-90. Um, it has to do with the state. So how we run those additional reports is if I want to show the custom guarantees and the custom reports, I will run it in a certain state that requires those reports to be displayed. That way I can provide transparency to a client. Um, and we'll do it with both a 40-60 or 10-90. They don't um, there's no additional pages only with a lower premium blend that'll be across the board um, if I so if I have a 40 60 split with a lisser which is the PUA term blend and then a 40 60 without one you're saying yeah. that the amount of literature is is equal it, it is yeah it has to do like when we make the the reports longer um, and show the guarantees and the lister de description with a different pr premium blend has to do with the state like if i put those on with like 40 60 10 90 it doesn't matter okay yeah that was that was the opposing argument i didn't i didn't have anything to say at the time i was like i'm not i'm i just don't know so yeah and, I, you know, I, I haven't heard that maybe yeah, they're just younger and experienced that, that, that happens sometimes right and so I, I think they highlighted some areas on what the lister is, the life insurance supplemental writer, if we're looking at mass mutual or if it's, yeah. or if it's guardian, it's a different term, but the, you, yeah. yeah. So the, the, the lister, um, what are the risk, you know, cause I think that is the opposing argument from the other, uh, uh YouTube channels that are like, you know, they're, they're trying to not necessarily say it's a bad design 1090, but they are saying there's some inherent risk that's not being expressed. And so from mm -hmm. your point of view, what would be like the worst case scenario if I do a 1090 on a, on a mass and I fund it for 30, 40, 50 years, what is the worst thing that could happen to me? Yeah. So nothing, I mean, the only risk that can really occur with any blended PUA, which is really a one-year term rider that's annual renewable, so it increases over time, like where a specific risk can occur is if I plan to fund it, call it a 10K per year, but I don't, I end up funding it at maybe 4K or 5K per year, I really underfund the product. Mm -hmm. And those term costs, because they're annual renewable, uh. they can increase. And how that, that term rider works is as I pump money into the whole life insurance product, as I pump money into the PUAs, in fact, let me show you, because this can be complex. I wish it wasn't, but it is. Show us. The I, I mean, you're going to find it's, there's not really a risk as long as you're aware of like just the design and such. All right, so this one works. Yeah. So let, let's, let's run through that. Let's say somebody, yeah, you know, I'm going to put in 60 grand. I'm going to fund this for 50 years, you know, 60,000 dollars times yeah. you know 50 years that's a really lot a lot that's a, that's three million dollars and let's a say lot. yeah and you know you're working with the client and you know they've never they've never done anything that long in their life you know so that's some of the conversations that i have with my clients i'm like what is the realistic commitment level that you're gonna fund this amount of money for that period of time because that is the opposing argument is that we should be funding policies forever um from, yeah. what, from what I'm hearing, but I'm like, well, what is the realistic commitment level of that individual if they come from a place like me, say, for example, you know, young kid that, you know, uh, multiple generations of, of, you know, people being in debt, nobody ever saving money, nobody ever investing money. What's the likelihood that I'm just going to magically, you know, have these uh, uh, skills and discipline levels and go. So, so, yeah, but let's but let's go through that. Let's say I'm confident as heck. I'm 25. Hey, Steve, I'm putting in 60 grand for the rest for it till 90 years old. And then come 45, I start putting in 10, five, two, yeah. one, nothing. And, but yet that term yeah. starts to eat away at my cash. I'm assuming. Correct. So what would happen there? So when we design those policies with that blended PUA, you kind of see it here. So this is a five pay, but this will explain just conceptually how it works mm -hmm. here. As we break down this illustration, this column, cash value of all ads, represents any money that this guy pays into PUAs 
and any dividends and interest applied to those PUA payments over time. It does not include any cash value derived from the base premium. So think of it this way, money I add to cash value, that PUA rider. Now why I mentioned that is the column immediately to the right of it, total face amount of ads represents how much additional whole life death benefit is purchased from that PUA payment. And then do this, there we go. Day one, or call it day zero, before I paid anything into it. There's your one year term rider, 1577. There's the cost for it in the first year, 511 bucks. Now, as you pump money into the policies, you have dumped in money into PUAs, bought you 266,602. That was added to your whole life death benefit of 422 and change. They have a calculator, take the 1577, Subtract it by the 266 and change, and guess what you're going to get? So as your whole life death benefit increases from PUA payments, the term rider decreases. And that almost every single time, and we've got videos that break this down with different scenarios, results in the actual term cost decreasing. Like the net cost, the rate might go up each year as we grow, grow older, but because it's shrinking rapidly, it goes down. Um, so that's how it works. Now, to your point, to the follow-up question is, hey, I've got this plan. What happens if I don't fund according to plan? Things go south, and instead of paying in 60, I'm paying in 10. So I don't buy down as much term, and the costs end up going up. That would be what one could argue as a risk, but of a really... Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that right there is where I think the opposing... Uh, of views come in with so, regards yeah. to N90. Yeah, so this is this is the exact design corporations do to alleviate that risk because they ask about the same thing or that's what we want to look out for is with a term rider, you can remove it, you can partially remove it so I can peel off a little bit each year. Mm -hmm. Like it just during the semi-annual reviews we have with people, I mean, that's the kind of stuff our client relations department, our agents, I look at and we just, we just monitor the cost. If someone's underfunding it, you just peel back a little bit. You don't have to worry about the mech because we've been underfunding it. Like it's it's pretty it's pretty easy to to avoid. Got it. The issue yeah. the issue really becomes when the client doesn't do what they intended. And if we designed a 60k a year for 50 years, that is an extremely big cost if I don't keep up with it, especially if yeah. I only did it for 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. And then I cut it in half by 30K, by 20K, by 10K. And maybe I was taught or told, you know, this is flexible funding, which you're absolutely yeah. right. It is flexible in, in funding. But if you want to maintain the ability to put in 60 grand, understand that you're not buying down as much term cost as we uh, initially expected. Yeah. And so the risk becomes you get the call on the insurance company saying, hey, you got to pay in more money. Uh, or this, this term is going to eat up the cash or we got to borrow from the cash to take care of the term. If that's an option. Or you, um, so yeah, but I mean, we would prevent it well before that. It's a oh. easy fix. All you would do is remove or reduce the term. Got it. Got it. You can, yeah. You can peel okay. it off. Easily. Yeah. Nice. Good stuff. No, this, I think that right there is going to help when clients question that term the way we put in terms the pua blend um i, I think it's really going to help with with clients overall and just you know prospects in general that are looking at this and questioning you know what do i do how do i do it how does it work um so we we've gone over a lot i i want to really thank you for going the extra mile because of the delays and the and the tech delays in our end but I just want to thank you so much for your time. We'll wrap it up here. We answered most of the questions. Uh, you guys can reach out to Steve. Uh, he put his email earlier, info at ibcglobal. Uh, did I say it? ibcglobalinc.com. Um, or just go to his YouTube channel. Check him out. Watch the content. Get engaged. And yeah. this will be available for replay. Um, any closing thoughts? Anything you want to close out with, Steve? Um no, just one thing. I know that, that Andre had a question. Andre, if you'd like more info on that, we can certainly send it to kind of 
wrap up that question. If dividends go up, will a higher base premium produce stronger results? Um, on an illustration, maybe, but based on actual results, no. We've never seen it happen, but um, we've got a bunch of data for that too.